Good morning. It's been um, busy working on some awesome projects in the last week and um, haven't had time to do any reading really. And But this morning, being October 27th, it's the year anniversary of the Raid of Treaty Camp at Standing Rock. And um, this time one year ago, I was still en route. And our prayers go out for everyone who's going to be reliving, being present on the ground both those days, um, working to stand for sovereign rights and working to protect the water and working to protect the land for coming seven generations. Um, And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about my personal experience on the 28th um, when I got there, today anyway. But this morning I'm reaching out because when I went there, I worked really hard to clear any preconceived notions of what I thought that I might be able to bring to help. I brought donations based on carefully reviewed lists and conversations with people. I had just come out of an Indigenous Studies program, an interdisciplinary one, called Resource Rebels, Environmental Justice Movements Building Hope. And so I had literally just finished independent learning that continued that program for me for a year. Um, and then, then September 3rd happened and Democracy Now! brought the attention, um, broke through my bubble of wrapping up coursework, really. I was kind of tunnel visioned on oil trains. No pun intended, but the Seattle Tunnel is a big concern. Um, <clears throat> so, But after that day, that was all I could think about. It was all over Facebook. And it may not have been everywhere, but it was everywhere in my mind. And when I arrived in late October, after I was able to communicate with my clients at the time, um, two of whom were, the second of which was a, uh, a grant funded project for the conservation district in the area that I'm from. And I had just completed a project for the Skokomish Watershed Action Team, a brochure update that um, looks like it may have worked to help them gain further funding needed. It's a really good story and I may share some of that as an example of work. Part of what I've learned in this last year um, is how to get out of the way, how to um, how to listen, how to stay quiet, and recalibrate what I think I know, and recalibrate what I think I have to offer in terms of effort and work and work quality. My background includes 16 years of marketing and communication work, nine years of which were in commercial marketing for one of the top 10 Fortune 500 companies in the States and with international distribution. I worked in a packaging graphics department and worked with all kinds of projects, anywhere from touching 10 to 18 projects a day, responding to 36 different departments. I'm really good at thinking and responding to a diverse group of people. And I decided in 2014 to devote my life and energy to turning that ability around to protecting the planet and I see sovereign people as the guardians of the regions of the planet that they have always lived upon and when I went to Standing Rock I held that in my heart and tried my best to get out of the way with what I thought I knew and it took me a while to get on board with Ocheti Shakoi Camp Media I was um, not able to get a standard media pass by the time I got there and I, I could 
empathize with the reasons why. Because the sovereign narrative needed to be told by sovereign people. And as it was, um, and as that continued to play out over this past year, um, it was a good call. When I came on board with that media crew, I made the map. I made the map for camp that helped to orient newcomers to the camp before we reached our maximum population in one weekend of about 14,000 people. Um, as at, by that time, I had been working in a dedicated way in that crew for a couple weeks and continued to through evac. Um, what I would say that I have tried this year to live by an ancient value system that is very clear and it seems like we already know these things and we already live by them. The seven Lakota values, which are the ones that we had listed on the site and I'll put a link up for that. Um, and I didn't write those, obviously. I did some updating to that page over the course of um, my time there. Um, but, and I found regular reasons to post about those on our Facebook page to align the purpose of what we were doing in the camp with that value system as I was understanding it and as I was being guided by the sovereign narrative um, from people, enrolled members of local tribes. And um, so prayer, respect, honesty, wisdom, gratitude, humility. And I find that the, um, that I always pause in the seventh one because it's usually the one I need to focus on the most. And because I'm doing this right now, I'm going to come back to that. A little bit embarrassed, but it's it always happens. So that's how I kind of work with those seven values is whatever the seventh one is, is always the one I need to be thinking about that day. So um, those are values that we were, we, out of world, white, white kids, um, were raised with, I would say, as part of our common understanding of the world. Um, and as our entry level understanding to any organization, group, community work, job. Um, but out there, I would say that we live them comprehensively with respect to the community that we were in and the planet around us. Um, it was the first time that I lived by those values, even for that short amount of time, with respect for all relatives, you know, respecting all life as all relatives, um, that we're all related to each other and that we need to have that, that space to hear each other. Um, so I've continued this year trying to live within that value system and I have discovered that um, in that process um, conflict with personalities at times it's uh, it's really I believe compassion it was actually the seventh one and I do my best to be compassionate but it's something I clearly need to think about working on today. Um, but I did hold compassion over this year. And, uh, and I have worked with four organizations, built three brands, including websites, logo, business cards, collateral material, um, some in collaboration with people, and some pretty much independently based on the understanding of the people or some written documentation provided up front. Um, I also stuck to the value of accountability and um, I believe, though I would say it hasn't been confirmed in writing or told directly to my face, um, that I was fired for living by the value of accountability 
and it's not an easy one to live in, live by in our system, honestly. For 500 years, our ancestors, my ancestors, my white ones, um, and I believe I'm, you know, I believe I only have white ancestors, at least that's what the records that I am able to access say. Um, but from my understanding, uh, no written agreement ever made with an indigenous tribe or people in the United States has ever been honored. And so it is a systemic originating behavioral pattern that uh, written agreements are not honored, verbal agreements are not honored. And it goes so deep in the mental patterning, if we were to look at a tapestry, this being a recent gift from a friend, and I'm really grateful for it. But if we look at other textiles, you know, this one, or any kind of sweater, I kind of look at the process of decolonizing, like unraveling a sweater. And I said this a lot out there at camp, that I was rapidly unweaving my understanding of the world and then trying to reweave based on the Lakota value system um, while remaining present and prayerful. And I've been praying pretty steadily in my own way for six years prior to Standing Rock, but I really, prayer took on a whole new dimension there and it helped me every day. And so, despite my best efforts this whole year to remain um, accountable to my responsibilities in the outer world and in the inner world, I have not been able to really do that completely on my own. I have had support from friends, from home, from people I know, from people who follow my writing, uh, and I'm really grateful for that. I've also had work. I relaunched my business or you know, it was always there, but I I found myself coming from a production artist background, um, joining a team of artists. And though I'm an artist, um, I got my I got myself out of the way and helped the other artists because they were they were they had been focused on their craft and their skill for so long that uh, that seemed the most beneficial thing for the community. So I did. And as a production artist. Um, could see all these places to fill in the gaps you know I'm a Virgo and uh, a decolonizing Virgo is a weird weird character blend I gotta say um, I'm really detail oriented and I'm really focused on um, organization in some aspect I'm not you know a neat freak but I do stick to a system and uh, and that experience working with that crew was one of the greatest and uh, one of the most inspiring that I've ever had. And I want to continue with that the spirit of that work. So in terms of accountability and responsibility to the outer world, I continued I continued on and um, tried very hard to, to line up work that would meet my projected monthly expenses. I've had small business training. I've had credit rebuilding training. I've had financial training. Um, but from what I understand about philanthropy, about grants, grant money comes from philanthropists. It comes from, a, you know, in our system we have a certain sector of society that can set aside funds for projects that they believe in and then those things get managed. And then there's other parts of our system where Funds are allocated in grants and budgets based on our federal system and agreements, right? But recently, um, fiscal year just started, and budget cuts have happened all through Indian country and all through the outer world. And um, I posted about this a little, and I'll probably share more about that. But I believe that um, there is no way that the philanthropy system that we have in place, um, and even all of our volunteer organizations and our charitable giving associations um, and networks, I don't think they're going to be capable of dealing with the chaos that those budget cuts are going to bring. And not for lack of trying either. But what happens when people get overextended and overcommitted, um, when too much of our society hinges on the volunteer efforts for the people to survive, is that people who do and people who give um, 
give past capacity even though I keep trying. And, you know, I've been accused of being a workaholic and I totally am. Totally am. But um, I, uh, this is the work I want to do. And I did my best to do it within the philanthropic world and that did not work. So, um, when I started running out of money in my hometown where I grew up, where common sense would dictate I would be the safest. Um, my heart and my mind and my soul were still all oriented here in the mid-region because I am convinced that this is part of the paradigm shift in a critical area on the planet for that. Um, nine months of the world's attention was focused on Standing Rock. That's unprecedented. And I've been studying communications for like, like the application and potential of social media since 2009. I've um, been studying ways to communicate all kinds of ways since 2001, and I've just been a visual communicator since I was five. Um, so where was I going with that? That for me, and what I know, my life experience, um, also coming from, also coming from two generations of psychiatry before me, so the study of the human mind, um, and then systems thinking, computer science, um, was my father's side, and all of my grandparents and my parents were teachers at some point, and farming on both sides goes back. So, you know, maybe I am responding to the generational memory here, cellular memory, whatever, um, but also this deep-seated feeling that indigenous rights have been violated and that that is wrong since I learned about it when I was nine in Idaho history class in fourth grade. The one class that we got on um, indigenous studies, which of course was framed to give us the understanding at the end of the class that native people no longer existed. Um, but I remember the study of the Nez Perce tribe and what happened to them. And I remember thinking at nine or ten years old, that's fucked up. And looking, you know, maybe I didn't say fucked up in my head then. It was consequences. But, you know, that was the feeling. And um, I remember thinking, well, of course we're never going to do something like that again, right? Why would we do that? Maybe it's naive, but that feeling stuck with me. And every time I felt like someone expecting me to set that feeling to the side because that's what's normal, that's what's done, and hanging on to that feeling is naive, I get pissed. And I've gotten a lot better about communicating my reactionary emotion there over my life, but still there. It's a deep-seated fuck you to that feeling that it's okay to just build a society on the backs of others and to take their land and to take their resources and to continue to do so. So, um, I hope I'm not the only nine or ten year old in Idaho who felt the same and uh, carried that feeling. And if you're hearing this, I hope you remember what that felt like. Anyway, uh, so I've been trying and um, Jesus. I don't think I'm be able to pull it together for the rest of this, actually. Um, I'm gonna leave it there. It's a heavy day. Prayers up for all the people who stood. And prayers up for all the people who were made woke. And who watched with us and helped us. And who reached out to their loved ones from home and let them know what they were seeing. <laughs> that bearing witness was a really important part of this. And um, you helped, you helped save people. So, stay vigilant. There's so many things to uh, find the strength within ourselves to build community for. 
by regionally wherever we're at um wherever we're at there is a reason to keep reaching out to people and to keep finding ways to connect with each other and to help and to be compassionate so um that's my update when you're later and uh